All right, the title of my sermon today is Love One Another. So I'm just focusing on these last couple of passages here where Jesus gives a new <coughs> commandment. <coughs> I wanted to just uh, have be a reminder for our church today that we have to love one another. But this passage of John 13, I don't know if you realize, it always blows my mind uh, if you were following along as we were reading that Jesus says somebody's going to betray me. And this has nothing to do with the sermon. It's just, this is the thought I always have when I read John 13. Is Jesus says, somebody's going to betray me. Then the disciples ask, who is it? Jesus says, I'm going to, the person I give a sop to is the one that's going to betray me. He then does it. And even though he gives it to Judas, when Judas goes out, they're still thinking, well, Judas is probably going to go buy something that we have, have need of. So that's how integrated Judas was into that group. You know, oftentimes you watch these... Uh, Bible, these, uh, these Bible movies or these Jesus movies, right? And, Ju and Judas is always portrayed as like this evil-looking, dark-haired man. But that's not the case. They, they could not, even when Jesus plainly said to them, this is the man that's going to betray me, they didn't know. But what I want to focus on today is this commandment to love one another. And I just want it to be a reminder and an exhortation to our church that we need to love one another. Now, I've spoken on this before. <clears throat> My first point is the importance of God's family. And I've, I've talked on the fact that your family here, your spiritual family here, ought to be very important. In fact, even more important than your physical family. I know sometimes that's hard to, to hear from you know, people that are very close with their family. And they're just like, blood is thicker than water. But you know what? The spirit <laughs> is thicker than blood, in a sense. And uh, we can see here, even in Jesus' day, in Matthew 12, look at what Jesus says here. How important it is to be close to your spiritual family. Verse 46, While he yet talked to the people, behold, his mother and his brethren stood without, desiring to speak to him. So if you can imagine the situation here, Jesus is preaching to a crowd of people. And his mother... Right? You think about the Catholics, how much they honor Mary. Right? And they say, oh, she's, they pray to her and they do all this. Well, she's outside with his half-brothers and sisters saying, hey, we, we need to talk to you. So it'd be like if I was preaching here today and my family rocked up and expected me to kind of drop everything and go see what they're doing. So it's the same here. It's like, hey, your, your family's here and they need to see you. Then one said unto him, Behold, thy mother and thy brethren stand without, desiring to speak with him with thee look at this and this is quite profound what jesus is saying here. i mean he's making a point but he answered and said unto him that told him who is my mother and who are my brethren and he stretched forth his hand toward his disciples and said behold my mother and my brethren for whosoever shall do the will of my father which is in heaven the same is my brother and sister and mother so you see here that even, you know, it's interesting that even his mother did not get, you know, a higher honor, well, you know, when she came to beckon him. So you think about the Catholics and how they, you know, even the Orthodox as well, how they lift up Mary. Well, here is the mother of Jesus Christ outside, come asking him, petitioning him, and he's just saying, well, who is my mother? Right? So it's not like it's even a, a you know, something so much higher to be the mother of Jesus Christ, even though she was a blessed woman. When, when Jesus here is saying, who is my mother? Who, is my, who are my brethren? You know, there was another example I'm thinking of right now where, you know, remember that, that, that guy came to Jesus and said, you know, blessed is the womb that bare thee and the paps which thou hast sucked. And he said, yea, rather blessed is him that does the will of God. You know, I'm paraphrasing, obviously. So he says, who is my mother? Who are my brethren? And he stretched forth his hand towards his disciples. So can you imagine sitting there in the crowd? And, and you, you know, Jesus, you're probably thinking, man, how, how, you know, if you're sitting there in the crowd as a disciple and you're thinking, how cool would it be to be related to Jesus? You know, be part of his family. You know, you think you have some special privilege there. Or well, his family comes to see him and he's preaching. And he says, you know what? Who is my mother? Who's my brethren? He stretches his hands forth to the people he's preaching to. He says, behold, my mother and my brethren so we see here the family of god ought to be more important to you 
There should be a stronger bond between the members of God's family than even your physical family. And those of us who have been in the faith for a while, you start to see that, right? You start to see that you have more in common with the people here than you do sometimes, or oftentimes, as you live for God, than even your own blood family. And you know, your blood family may forsake you one day, but God forbid that God's people would forsake you. This is why this is where you can come and be part of a family where you know you have a common bond that is eternal. <clears throat> Now, because we are a family, unfortunately, you know, we may fight like a family too. You know, and that's why oftentimes churches have conflicts, they have personal disputes. You need to expect that. You need to expect that sometimes somebody's going to say something that might upset you. You may upset other people. So just like family, you know, when, when you get in a fight, you think about when you're younger, you get in a fight with your sister or your parents, it's not like you just, oh, I'm done with this family. Right? You work through it. You know that you're going to upset each other and you just, you just take that as a part of your relationship. Yeah, like I'm gonna, my brother's going to bug me. I'm going to bug my brother or sister and whatnot. That's how you got to think of it in a church. You, know, you will get on each other's nerves sometimes, but then it's not that you don't like each other pers you know, personal, personally. You've got to try and get, get over it and get, get along. 1 Timothy 5, look at how we ought to treat each other. Rebuke not an elder, but treat him as a father. The younger men as brethren, the elder women as mothers, the younger as sisters with all purity. So this is how we should be interacting with one another at church. We should ought to be thinking of each other as family members. Those of us who are older as a father or a mother, those of us who are the same age as us or younger as brothers and sisters. So this is how a church should operate. This is how a church should think of one another as family. Do you think of it that, that way? You know, when you think about the people in this church and you think about how you have relationships with people in this church, do you, are you striving to have that closeness like you have with family? You think if you're like this with your brother or you, you know, your sisters, you guys are like chummy and whatnot. That's the sort of relationship you want to be striving with here, that you're close, that you, you, you want to spend time with, that you confide in one another, you have those relationships. That's what we got to work towards. This is why I'm not for churches that segregate, you know, genders. Sometimes, you know, you go to some churches um, and, and some cults as well where, you know, it's like, you know, women will sit on one side and men will sit on the other. This segregation where it's like, oh, you know, it's not proper to talk to the opposite gender, you know, it's not proper to talk to this person or that person. I mean, you don't treat your family like that, right? You know, like brothers talk to sisters, you know, bro you know sons can talk to mothers and fathers can talk to daughters. There's, there's a relationship there between all, you know, all the members of the family. And it should be like that at church as well. You shouldn't think because, you know, I'm female, I don't talk to the men or male, I don't talk to the women. We've got to cross those boundaries. You've got to learn to be able to relate not just to men, but just to, to the women as well. So in our church, you got to, what I'm saying here is you've got to get to know each other, guys. You know, I know I, because I pastor this church, I know everybody. And sometimes I think, you know, I, I, I know what's going on in these people's lives and I get to know people. <clears throat> but you want to do that too. So when you think, when you come to church, don't just stick in your little cliques. Don't just go with people that you're comfortable with. If there's somebody you don't know that well, then you, know, you want to sort of reach out to them, have a conversation with them, say hello, introduce yourself, ask some questions about them so that you can start to build this relationship and you can start to treat each other like family. So because we are family, unfortunately, sometimes we may fight like family and that's why it's so important for us to love one another. Now, my second point is, first point was the importance of God's family. Second point is the mark of a disciple. Now, we started in John 13, so you kind of know where I'm going with this. But what really should be the mark of a disciple of Jesus Christ? Well, let's talk about some things that people try and make the mark of a disciple and make it like the one thing that they're known for, that they're a follower of Jesus. But this is not what Jesus says should be the thing that defines you as a disciple of Jesus Christ. Number one is the name by what you call yourself. You know, we call ourselves Christians, but, you know, there are a lot of people that are Christians that are not really living the way they ought, not really loving one another as they ought. 
You know, even in our fundamental circles, they're like, man, I'm Baptist, or I'm Orthodox, or I'm this, or I'm that, I'm Lutheran, or I go by this label or that label. Is that how you should be known? Is that like the defining thing about you, what association or what church you're a part of? Is that what should define you as a disciple of Jesus Christ? You know, it's, it's funny in the church we were going, a lot of the churches you go to, in, in where we were in Mexico anyway, um, Christians weren't known as you know, Christians, like Cristianos. They, they were known as hermanos. So if you know Spanish, hermano, hermana, is brother and sister. And because they would always call each other like, hey, hola, hermano, hermanas. So then the unbelievers, the people that didn't go to church, they, they, they knew Christians as, the, oh, they're the hermanos people. <laughs> the hermanos people. Because they're always calling each other brother and sister. And they'll say, rather than saying it's a Baptist church, it's like, oh, that's an hermanos church because of how they call each other. So is it the name that should identify us? No, it's not the name. What about the appearance? Some people think that's what should define them as a Christian. It's how I have my hair, you know, women with long hair, men with short hair, how I dress. Uh, if you think about the, the standard IFB women's uniform, which is like a, a hoodie, it's like a hoodie jumper with like denim skirt all the way to the ground. Like is, is that what should define you as a Christian? Now I'm saying, is, am I saying there's anything wrong with wearing that? No, there's nothing wrong with being modest, you know, but it's not like it's a specific way you need to dress. You know, you, you're, not, you're not a disciple of Jesus Christ because you wear a suit and tie. You know, you're not a disciple of Jesus Christ because you, you dress formal, you dress casual. It's, it's, that's not what ought to define you as a disciple of Jesus Christ. What about the way you talk? Now, should we have a godly way of talking? But is that what should identify you as a disciple of Jesus Christ? If you think about how some of the American Baptists talk, hey, brother, hallelujah, praise the Lord, brother. Like, do you have to start talking like that in order to identify yourself as a disciple of Jesus? No, that shouldn't be the defining factor. What does Jesus say the defining factor of a disciple should be how does how do people how are people meant to know that you are a follower of jesus christ well in john 13 a new commandment i give unto you that ye love one another so that's where i get the title of my sermon as i have loved you that ye also love one another and that's an amazing thought because if you think about how how did jesus love us right he he humbled himself he took upon the form of a servant so you see how he was willing to go from his high place down to where his disciples were not only did he humble himself but he became obedient unto death even the death of the cross that's the sort of love that christ has for us and he says you ought to love one another as i have loved you man that is a a high calling isn't it so that's the standard that he's setting to say this is the sort of love that you should be striving for right it's not just a love where we just get along and we just tolerate each other you know he's saying no no we have to have the love where we are willing to serve even to the point where we're willing to die for you're willing to lay down your life for each other that you also love one another now look at this in verse 35. By this. By what? By the fact that we have this great sacrificial, self-sacrificing love for one another. By this shall all men know that ye are my disciples, if ye have love one for another. So that is the mark of a true disciple. That's what we're striving for. That's what we want in this church. We need to strive for that point where we love one another the way that Christ loved us. Now, point number three is the importance of charity. The importance of charity. We're going to go to 1 Corinthians 13. And I think this is a very profound thought when I think about this. In 1 Corinthians 13, let's uh, read through this first. He says here, Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels and have not charity, I am become a sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. So Paul is saying here, even if he did, right? So I, I don't believe Paul is saying here that he did actually speak in the tongues of angels, but 
And we see here later on, because he says here, though I, have these other, though I did these other things which he didn't do. So he's saying here, he's not saying that he does. He's, what he's saying here is, even if I did, even if I had this really eloquent speech, even though I could speak in languages that people didn't even know. But look at what he says here. Have not charity. I am become as sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. So what is he saying here? He's saying here, even though he has like this eloquent speech and he can make you know, people move with the way he talks and, 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 and he, can, he can speak really well. But he says, if he doesn't have love, if he doesn't have charity, then all that is, is if you think about it, a sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. What do you think of that when you think of a sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal? I think of you know, like a little triangle, like ding, 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 or tinkling cymbal or whatnot. And sounding brass, maybe it's just like somebody who doesn't know how to play the trumpet. I was, I was trying to learn the trumpet when I was in, I was in Mexico. You know, you first trying to learn the trumpet, you're like... <laughs> that's what the Bible says, that that's what you sound like when you don't have love, when you don't have charity. It's a sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge... And though I have all faith so that I can remove mountains and have not charity. Look at this. I am nothing. So see, it sounds like charity is pretty important. It's like you can put, you know, if you know mathematics, it's like you can put brackets around your whole life and put a multiplication sign and then put charity after that. So if you have no charity, you can just cancel out all the good that you've done. You know, I am nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor. And this is why I know that it says even though. It's just even if, right? Because he didn't do all these things. Even though I bestow. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor. And though I give my body to be burned. Right? So Paul didn't do that. And have not charity. They profiteth me nothing. So we can see here the three different lines of thought. Is the first one is, you know, you think you sound really good, but you don't have charity. You, then you've become as a sounding brass and a tinkling cymbal. And, and oftentimes this is the case. You know, I know even with, with preachers, have you ever gone to a church where you, know, you don't have a good relationship with the preacher or you know, maybe you don't respect the preacher? You tend not to listen, right? So that's why it's very important that I, you know, I try and have a good relationship with you guys because when I, I'm up here teaching the Bible, I don't want you to just write off the things that I'm trying to teach you because of a bad relationship, right? It's the same, but it's the same with other people. You know, if you want to have influence in somebody else's life and your words not to fall on deaf ears, the relationship you have with them and the charity you show them is going to change whether or not you sound to them as the tongue of men and angels or you sound to them as a sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal, somebody that's not pleasant to listen to. So you've got to think about that as well. So that's how you sound. This one is, you know, the value of, of who you are, right? In the sense, if you have all these gifts, you have all this talent, but you don't have charity, you are nothing. And then the third one is your works, isn't it? The things that you do and the profit you get from them. So though you do this, you know, you give away all your goods or you even sacrifice your own body, but you have not charity, it profiteth me nothing. So that's why this one says, I am nothing. This one sounds, you're going to sound silly. This one says, you are nothing. And this one says you will not profit from the, the works you try and do without charity. <clears throat> so that's why charity is so important. And that's why people sometimes get it mixed up the other way, where they feel like, well, I don't have to have charity if I just have truth. And they just think, well, I just have all this truth and truth and truth. I'm just going to tell it like it is and have the truth. But without the charity, the Bible says it's nothing. You're a sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. So in fact, you have to make sure you grow in charity first and then that almost, that gives you the right, that gives you the, the effect that you want when you try and teach, when you try and talk to people. If you have it the other way around, then you may just be spinning your wheels and not going anywhere. And you've got to think about that as well in terms of the relationships you have with other people. It's not just when it comes to preaching and teaching. And we see here in 2 Peter 1, charity is actually a much higher level of spirituality than what you know as a Christian. 2 Peter 1, look at here. And beside this, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, 
So we see here, first you get saved, you have faith. You want to add to that faith some good, some good qualities, right? If you think about virtues, we looked at the fruit of the Spirit this morning uh, in Bible Club. So you want to add to your faith virtue. And to virtue, knowledge. See, so we don't want to get just puffed up just with knowledge. And in fact, knowledge, even though, you know, we, you know, we want to be Bible-believing, I'm not saying it's not important, Bible-believing, know what the Bible says, but notice how it's only the third step in this progression in terms of what you want to add. So if you, that's why some Christians, they know a lot and they think they're very spiritual in their spiritual life, but they're actually just at this point, right? So at this point, there's a lot of godliness that you want to add later on to that faith. Because you know what? You can be saved and you can know a lot, but that doesn't mean you're spiritually mature. You know, spiritual maturity is about how you deal now with other people, how you deal with situations. When things don't go right, how do you deal with that? How do you treat other people? How do you love? That's what spiritual maturity is about. Add to virtue knowledge. So if you think about it, if you think about your own spiritual life, it kind of goes through these phases, right? And this is how it should work. You get saved and then people start telling you, hey, here are some good things to do. Where you, You're not really thinking about why you do it. You're just like, okay, well, I'm saved better get baptized, you know, you should, you know, this is what they're telling me to do, go to church, start reading my Bible. So you're adding some virtues to your life, but really not, you, you may not understand fully why you're doing it. And then as you start doing those things, then you start to get this knowledge, you start to learn that, ah, oh, well, this is why it's important to pray. This is why it's important to come to church. This is why it's important to be reading my Bible. It's why it's important to be going soul winning and, you know, be, be faithful to church and, you know, this is what, oh, this is what baptism means and whatnot. And to knowledge, temperance. So now that you're starting to do some good things, you know why, now you have some discipline. Because remember at the beginning, it's all exciting. You just do it because it's new, you're curious. But now you get to the point where, hey, you've got to do it whether you feel like doing it or not. You need some discipline to actually do what's right, even though you don't always feel like doing what's right. And to temperance, patience. See, now as you start to grow in your godliness and your zeal and your discipline, patience in the Bible is not just what the Bible would use the term like long-suffering. Patience is when you're going through hard times. Right? So then now when you're trying to be faithful and it's not so easy to be faithful, maybe you're being ridiculed, maybe you're actually getting persecuted right, for doing what is right and saying, hey, you need to be disciplined and even go through some hard times now. This is growing in, that, in, in, in your spiritual life here. And to patience, godliness. So what is godliness? Godliness is where you're really trying to get all that sin out of your life. Right? So obviously throughout this, you're getting sin out of your life, but you want to get to the point where you're godly, where you actually desire now to do right things as opposed to you're constantly struggling to not do wrong things. Right? So you're trying to grow in there. And as you go through this, when you're temperate and patient, this gets easier, right? It does get easier. Where, you know, you are not struggling so much with the sins that you used to, and there are things that don't allure to you as much as they did before, right? Because you're walking in the Spirit. And to godliness, look, brotherly kindness. So brotherly kindness, what's the difference between brotherly kindness and charity, which is the last one? Well, brotherly kindness is just when you're nice to each other. Right? Because you can, just be ni- you can just be pleasant and nice to one another, but that doesn't mean you have charity. Yeah. You see the difference? Because you know, sometimes people go to a church and they're just like pleasant and say hello. Yeah. We, we just, we, we don't, we don't, there's no animosity, but that doesn't mean there's charity either. Yeah, yeah. Right? Because charity is when you actually are considering the other people, you're caring, you actually want to help and be a blessing to them. It's proactive, right? It's not just neutral where it's just, come to church, well, just get along with everyone. That's the brotherly kindness, where you're just nice to everybody. Right? You don't have any animosity, but to brotherly kindness, you want to add on charity. So you see how charity is so much further along the spiritual growth than just knowledge, but sometimes people just get knowledge and they think they're really spiritual. But think about what's so much harder than just learning Bible doctrine. What's so much harder than... Le- and, and for those of you who know this, it, it, you know in your life that it's true. Like It's so easy to just listen to sermons yep. and just read things and just learn stuff. 
Right? Especially when it's interesting at the beginning, or if you're listening to a preacher, you know, that's maybe even more you know, interesting than me, right? I don't even think I'm that interesting a preacher. But you, know, you may have preachers that you listen to that are really interesting. Man, it's easy to just soak that all up, right? But you know what's hard? Putting it into practice. Amen. Actually doing it. And that's why here the knowledge is easy, but when you get the discipline, doing it, where now it's not easy to do it, because sometimes you can get the discipline when you're going to a church and it's easy and everything's fun and you're getting along with everyone. But what about when you're in a, when you're in a situation where it's not easy? Where not, not all your buddies are doing it. Because some people grow up in a church, all their buddies there, great social scene, a lot, of, a lot of kids that they grew up with and now they're all teens, they've got all their buddies there. Oh man, it's easy to be serving God, going to youth group every week, going to church every week, being faithful. What happens when all your friends start working? They start quitting church. Are you going to keep doing it? Are you going to be patient with it when it's no longer as easy to do as it was before? So you want to get to that point of charity. It's so much of a higher goal. For if these things be in you and abound, they make you that you shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But he that lacketh these things is blind and cannot see afar off and hath forgotten that he was purged from his old sins. See, oftentimes when we are lacking these qualities that we just went through, it's because you've forgotten what Jesus Christ has done for you. you know, you're not no longer thinking about the things of God. You're no longer appreciating what Jesus has done for you. And because you have a lack of love with God, you're showing a lack of love as well in your life. Wherefore, the rather, brethren, give diligence to make your calling and election sure. For if you do these things, you shall never fall. See, that's why we have to actually be diligent about doing this. These things don't happen automatically. Man, I wish they happened automatically. You know, I, I wish, like, you can just get saved and just woo, 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 faith, knowledge, and just, I'm just charity. I'm a charity bot now. I wish that was the case. No, you have to be diligent. This is something you have to actually be proactive about and think about and consider and actually strive to do. And you know what? That's how you'll make sure you don't get out of the faith. Right? You have to be actually diligent about these things. Now, the last point I just want to talk about, this is probably the longest part. Number four is, how should we love? I want to just talk about some practical things we can do. We, we can see now the importance of charity, the importance of God's family and the importance of loving one another. That really should be the mark of Christianity. Like when people think about Christians, should they think, oh, you know, that was the church with the fancy building. Well, those are the, those are the people that were really dressed nice. Well, those are the people that kind of spoke a little bit weird. They're always saying, praise the Lord, praise the Lord, praise the Lord. You know, the Hermanos Church, like in, in Mexico. Now, you know what people should really walk away with if they spend any amount of time in our church? Like, man, those people had so much love. You know, they, you know, it's like they, they, they strive to be my friend and they were reaching out to me. Man, when times get tough, you know, and, they, they, and they, they know that when they were here, man, they felt like a part of the group. You know, sometimes people can go to, to a church and this is really sad for any church. If you go to a church for a long time and just feel like you're never really part of the group, and that's, that's, that's the sort of environment we need to create. You know, that doesn't just happen. You know, like when people go to a church, you know, have you ever been to a church and you go there and you're like, oh man, the people are so friendly and so loving. That's not just automatic. It's that's because that's how those people were. You know what I mean? So it's not just, oh, you know, this church is just like that. A church becomes like that when the people in the church are diligent about being like that. So if we want a church where people come here, they feel included, then you need to be like that. So it's not just, oh, the church needs to be like that and you separate yourself from actually being part of this body. When you think the church needs to be like that, you say, oh, man, I need to be like that. So when you think, man, if, if I, I want this church when people come to feel welcoming, then you need to be welcoming. I want this church to be friendly, then you need to be friendly. Man, I want a church that helps people when they're down. You need to be somebody willing to help people when they're down. That's how it needs to work, because we are the church. If, if, we, don't, if we don't do it, who's going to do it? Who's gonna do it? <laughs> I know you guys are always wondering, I'm walking here. People always tell me, one day you're going to trip on this court. So that, that was today. How we ought to love. 
how we ought to love. Let's, let's think of some practical ways. Number one is we pray for one another. We pray for one another. Colossians 1. We give thanks to God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you, since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love which you have to all the saints. Now, as I go through these, I'm not talking to you from here, I, from a place where I've arrived. I need this sermon as much as you guys. It's a reminder for me as much as it is for you guys. But, you know, oftentimes when I read the epistles of Paul, I'm just so convicted at his, his love for the people. Because, you know, for him to be able to write this under the inspiration of the Holy Ghost, saying, man, I'm always praying for you guys. Can you guys say that about each other? Can you say, like, man, you know, when I pray, I'm always making mention of you in my prayers. Man, that's a, that's a convicting thing, right? This is how one way we can truly love one another is that we pray for each other. Look at this. Praying always for you since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love which you have to all the saints. So I want to show you, I've got four passages here just quickly on praying for people. And you can see that Paul is praying for people throughout their whole Christian life. We see here he's praying for people that just got saved. Ephesians 1, Wherefore I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and love unto all the saints, cease not to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers. Look, he didn't stop. He ceased not to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers. That the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. The eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of his calling and what the riches of the glory of his, of his inheritance in the saints. What is he saying here? What is he praying for for the Ephesians? He's praying that their eyes will open spiritually, that they will understand the things of God, that their heart will get, like, God, like we say, that God will get a hold of their heart. That's what he's praying here. This is how you can pray for other people. You can pray that God will move them so that they'll grow in their faith. So you can see here that he's praying not just for new believers, but he's praying for believers to grow in their faith. Philemon 4, I thank my God, making mention of thee always in my prayers, hearing of thy love and faith, which thou hast toward the Lord Jesus and toward all saints, that the communication of thy faith may become effectual, acknowledging of every good thing which is in you in Christ Jesus. For we have great joy and consolation in thy love, because the bowels of the saints are refreshed by thee, brother. So he's saying here, what is he saying here? He's praying that the work that Philemon does is going to be effectual. It's going to have good impact. So this is where we can think about how we pray for people in ministry, or we pray for people doing a work, we're praying for them that the work that they're doing will be effective and will have good fruit. And lastly here, 1 Thessalonians 1, we give thanks to God always for you all, making mention of you in our prayers, remembering without ceasing your work of faith and labor of love and patience of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ in the sight of God and our Father. So here he's praying for more mature Christians that are doing the work faithfully. So this is, what I get from this is, you can see here Paul is praying for people always. Right? And he's even praying, it's, it's almost like you can think of it like he's prayed for people as they're growing through the faith. He's praying for them when they got saved. He's praying that, hey, God will help them to grow. Then when they're, you know, when they're serving, he's praying that God will use the work that they do. And he's praying that God will keep them doing the work that they're doing. So this is how we can pray for one another. We want to pray that we're all growing and, and you know, getting better and, and more effective in our witness and in our work for God. So what's another thing? Oh, just before I go on is, you know, sometimes, you know, obviously we want to pray for people's spiritual growth, but we want to pray for people when they're having issues as well, like that as well. And, and I know, you know, we have a church prayer list, but, you know, and, and oftentimes, like, I, I know what's going on with, people's lives because I'm the one managing the church prayer list so I'm the one adding things on updating it but I think it's good practice for you guys to keep your own prayer list of things that you should you pray for because you know what if you don't write it down you're probably going to forget you know and and we need to make it we need to be proactive in our love right not just pray oh now I'm praying I better like oh now I try and remember like you know like how bad should you feel when you're like 
you, sometimes you don't even remember people's names. It's like, I know there's an issue. I can't remember what their name was. You know, I knew it was the, the daughter of somebody's cousin. What was their name? It's because we don't make it a point to actually internalize people's prayer requests. And really, it's just something that is habit that we have to change. It's, it's no different to when you're trying to remember people's names. You know when people say things like that, they say, oh, I'm just bad with names. But the reason why people are bad with names is because they didn't care enough to remember somebody's name. You know, so I, you know, I'm not saying I'm perfect, but I, I definitely try in my, I know in my life, I try and make it a point to remember people's names. That's why when I go to even my son's soccer and now we're going to jiu-jitsu, I meet somebody new, I try and remember their name. So if I didn't catch it the first time, I ask for it. I just repeat it to myself a few times, make some connections. You know, oh, this, this person's the father of this person. And then next time I remember. So then when I say hello to them, I can at least call them, greet them by name. Well, it's, it's got to be the same with prayer requests. If somebody mentions something to you, oh, I pray for this, you want to make it a point to remember. Write it down if you don't remember. Keep a list for yourself so that when you pray, you're updating it, then at least you know what people's prayer requests are. So we want to be proactive about this. All right, the second one is we don't want to leave it just as prayer, only as prayer. Yes, we pray for one another, but we want to love each other, not just in words, but also in deed. Look in, here in 1 John 3. Hereby perceive we the love of God, because he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. And I just think it's so amazing that all, all the ways we are commanded to love each other, Jesus does this for us. You know, you know Jesus intercedes for us. He prayed for us when he was here. You know, when you think about it in John, uh, you know, we didn't read through it today, but you know, John 14, 15, 16, he's praying for his disciples. But also here, so not only do we pray for one another, but here we don't want to just only just leave it as words. We want to also have practical ways of loving each other as well. And we see here that Jesus laid down his life for us. And he says here, this is how we ought to love the brethren. We ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. But whoso hath this world's good, and seeth his brother have need, and shutteth up his bowels of compassion from him, how dwelleth the love of God in him? So he's saying here, if you know somebody that has a need and you have the means to fulfill that need, but yet you don't try and fulfill that need, then, you know, how can you say the love of God dwells in you? My little children, let us not love in word, neither in tongue. So the context here being obviously just only saying things without actually doing something for them, but in deed and in truth. So we want to put feet to our prayers. We want to put action to our words. You know, we're saying we're praying for somebody, but then you have a way to help them, then make that happen. Help them. And I'm not saying you have... The expectation here is, you know, not just helping everybody, because sometimes you, you only have so much resources and so much time. So the, you, obviously you can't be everyone's help, you know, as much as you may want to be. But where you can, where it's practical and where you're able to, help somebody, not just leave it at words. And it might be that, you know, somebody is sick and they need some help. Or somebody is pregnant and they need some help and support. Or somebody, you know, there's all sorts of things. Somebody may need to move house. You know, like sometimes people move and you help them out with just physically. Or, you know, maybe you, you know somebody's looking for a job. So you ask around. You just... You know, this is where you can help people out by helping them in their lives. All right, let's go on. The third one is to have a mind of a servant. This is how you can love one another. Philippians 2. Let nothing be done through strife or vainglory, but in loneliness of mind, let each esteem other better than themselves. Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. So one way you can have a mind of a servant is you consider other people. Like when you go about your life, when you do things, do you actually think about the others in church? Do you think about, you know, let's say you're going to organize something or you go out. Do you think about, oh, yeah, I wonder who in church may want to come along with us or may want to do something with us? Who could benefit from this? So you're not just thinking of yourself. You're thinking of others as well. 
And like with the prayer list, you want to make it a point to do this. You make it. This is one way you can serve one another when you think about each other in this way. Let's read on. Verse 5. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, and took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. So when I think about having the mind of a servant, what I think about is you're thinking about others more than you're thinking of yourself. And you're willing to do something for others more than you're expecting something to be done for you. Now, oftentimes in a church, people get the mindset of not being a servant where they're just expecting to be served all the time right they're thinking well nobody's friendly to me nobody says hello to me nobody invites me over for dinner nobody does anything for me i needed help where was everybody when i needed help now should people be helping people that need help should people be friendly? of course but that's not the mindset you should have the mindset you should have is how can I be friendly to others? How can I be a friend to somebody else? How can I be a blessing to, to other people? What can I do for this church? You know, it's like that famous speech. Don't ask what your country can do for you, but ask what you can do for your country. It's the same in church. Don't, don't come to church thinking, oh, this church, what is this church going to do for me? You come to church thinking, hey, what can I do for the body of Christ? How can I be a blessing? This is the sort of mind that Jesus had, and this is the sort of mind that he wants us to have. We want this mindset of what can we do for others. And you know, what's funny is, when you ask the question, or when somebody says, well, I needed help, and nobody was there to help me, often the people that are serving are the ones that get help when they need help. Why? Because this is just a principle of reaping and sowing that if you have the mindset of a servant and you come to church willing to serve others, serving other people selflessly, you know what? When you need help, you're probably going to get help because you've affected other people's lives. They want to reciprocate that favor. That's just the reaping and sowing. But you know what? Even if you don't get that, you should have a mind to serve anyway. Look at what Jesus says in Mark 10. He says, But Jesus called them to him, and saith unto them, Ye know that they which are accounted to rule over the Gentiles exercise lordship over them, and their great ones exercise authority upon them. So he's saying in the world, amongst unbelievers, this is how it works. People just want to lord over other people. But so shall it not be among you. But whosoever will be great among you shall be your minister. And whosoever of you will be the chiefest, right, so like the, the greatest, shall be servant of all. For even the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. So you see here, the objective here is not to be served. We want to serve one another, and that's how we love each other, as we think about, hey, how can I be a blessing to somebody else, right? Love that serves. It doesn't expect to be served. And it's especially like that when you're trying to make friends. You know, when you're trying to make friends in the church, that's just a really big one because oftentimes I hear people, you know, not just in this church, but in others, just saying like, oh, you know, just people aren't always that friendly to me and whatnot. See, that mindset is a mindset of being served because why, why are you thinking about how friendly people are to you? Why don't you focus on being friendly to others? And you know what? When you're friendly to others, that's how you make friends. <laughs> you know, you try and be friendly to other people, you're friendly, and then that's how you start to build those relationships. You start first. All right, second last one. Your example. The way you can love others in the church is the sort of example that you set to the others in church. Ephesians 4. From whom the whole body fitly joined together. So this is now talking about the church as a body, how we all come together, we're all part of the one body and compacted by that which every joint supplieth, according to the effectual working in the measure of every part, so we all play a part in the edification of this body, maketh increase of the body unto the edifying of itself in love. 
So you see how the church needs to bind together and be strong relationship-wise so we can edify one another and support one another and help each other to grow. Then he goes on in verse 16. This I say, therefore... So what's one way we can actually help the body be compact and every joint supplieth? This I say, therefore, and testify in the Lord, that ye henceforth walk not as other Gentiles walk, in the vanity of their mind. So what is he saying here? You've got to think about how you actually live. Are you just living like an unbelieving, worldly person? Because you know what? That's going to affect how the body is compacting and helping each other to the edifying of itself in love. It's your example. It's how you actually live. See, I, I, this I say, therefore... Why is he saying this? Because he wants the body to be close and testify in the Lord that ye henceforth walk not as other Gentiles walk in the vanity of their mind, having the understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them because of the blindness of their heart, who being past feeling have given themselves over unto lasciviousness to work or uncleanness with greediness. So obviously this is talking about the you know, unsaved, ungodly, but if we have elements of this in our life, in the way we talk, the way we dress, the, the things that we do in our life, that's going to affect not just your church members, but it's going to affect the next generation. So how we love our church members is also the example that we set. Think about when we get fired up about something, it's going to fire up other people. When we are committed to church, that's going to help others be committed to church. When we set a good example in the way we talk, the way we dress, the way we conduct ourselves. You know what? That's loving other people because you're going to set a good example for their children as well. That's why my children look to you as an example as much as your children may look to me for an example. Because, you know, my children, I am their parents. You know, oftentimes, you know, you try and be, set a good example to your kids, but sometimes your kids just look up to others more than they do to other people. That's just part of being a kid, that you don't you know, always look up to your parents the way you should. And they may look to you because they don't know you. You're not the one telling them off all the time, right? You're not the one like denying them of this and denying them of that. So they look up to you and think, oh man, you know, you're really fun and everything. And you know what? If you're worldly, if you're like, you know, late to church and you're not compassionate about the things of God, you hardly go so they're going to see that. And they're going to think, oh, you know, like this friend, like, they don't do that. The person I know at church doesn't do that. So you just make it so much more difficult for the parents when you're not godly as well. So that's why all of us need to have this sort of mindset so we can love one another in this area. What effect does our walk have on the church? What effect does our walk have on the next generation? And the last one I want to talk about here is we need to be proactive about our love. So we're not just waiting to be loved and then we'll respond, right? So it's not just... I just do things for the people that I like. Let's see what Jesus has to say about that in Luke 6. Luke 6, verse 31. And as ye would that men should do to you, do ye also to them likewise. For if ye love them which love you, what thank have ye? For sinners also love those that love them. You see, when you do something nice for somebody that's nice to you, Jesus is saying here, what, what did you do that was so difficult? Because you know what? It's easy to love people that love you back. You know, it's easy to be friendly to the people that you get along with. Right? So maybe there are some people in church that you know better, that you get along with, and you come and you're nice to them. That, that's easy. Right? And if you do good to them which do good to you, what thank have you? For sinners also do even the same. And if you lend to them of who you hope to receive, what thank have you? For sinners also lend to sinners to receive as much again. But love ye your enemies, and do good, and lend, hoping for nothing again. And your reward shall be great, and ye shall be the children of the highest, for he is kind unto the unthankful and to the evil. Be ye therefore merciful, as your Father also is merciful. So you see, when you're just nice to the people that are nice to you, that's not what you should be striving for. 
What you want to strive for, even in this church, is to try to reach out to the people that you don't know so well. Right? So being friendly with people that you are already friends with is, is nothing special. But you know what? Being friendly to somebody that you don't know so well, that you haven't really built that relationship with yet, that is a much higher level of spiritual maturity. And this is the sort of love that God does to us. In 1 John 4, look, herein is our love made perfect, that we may be bo have boldness in the day of judgment, because as he is, so are we in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casteth out fear, because fear hath torment. He that feareth is not made perfect in love. We love him because he first loved us. If a man say, I love God and hateth his brother, he is a liar. For he that loveth not his brother whom he hath seen, how can he love God whom he hath not seen? And this commandment have we from him, that he who loveth God love his brother also. So two things I just want to point out here. One is, you see how God is proactive in his love. God didn't wait for us to love him. In fact, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. So God didn't wait for us to love him first. He was proactive about it. He did it first. Right? So when we think about making friends at church, that's how we have to have that mindset. You know, if we all have that mindset. You know, I try and tell my kids as well. You know, if you are friendly, you just focus on being friendly. You know what? You're going to have friends. Right? But if you don't focus on actually serving in the way you love one another, then you may find yourself not having any friends at all, not having any relationships to build. So you have to be proactive about it. But look at this, if a man say, I love God, and hateth his brother, he is a liar. For he that loveth not his brother whom he hath seen, how can he love God whom he hath not seen? So you see, you can talk about you love God, you love God, love God all you want, but if you can't even love your brothers and sisters in Christ who you can see, how do you love God who you can't see? So it's a good barometer on how much love you actually have as a Christian is how much do I love the people here? You know, do you just write the people, are you just like, oh, I'm done with trying to make friends here, done with, you know, just to do this? No, no, because I mean, that's how, that's a barometer on how much love you have for God, is how much you love the people here in this church. And this commandment have we from him, that he who loved God, love his brother also. So, love one another. We want to be proactive about it. This is not just for me. You know, because oftentimes, I just want to give you one more thought. Oftentimes, people look at the bishop of a church and think, oh yeah, but Victor, that's your job. You know what I mean? Like your job as a bishop is to sort of know what's happening in anyone, everyone's life and to pray for them and to support them and, and things like that. And that's where you're wrong. It's not just my job. See, my job is to set the example for you. So if you think, Ah, you know, well, Victor, sort of, he's friendly here and friendly there, and he gets, he has these people over, and he gets, the, but that's, yeah, that's what he does because he's the bishop. But don't forget that what I do as a bishop, I'm trying to set the example for you. So the, re, so if I, if you know me, if you know, okay, Victor does it. Victor keeps a prayer list. Victor has people over. Victor goes and greets people. Victor's talking. Victor's getting to know people and trying to make friends. You know, you, you, you kind of think as a bit, and rightfully so, right? I mean, the bishop is kind of the glue that's right? keeping everyone here because everyone kind of knows each other. If you don't know each other already, you kind of know each other through me. So I understand, but I shouldn't be the only one like that. So you see, so you don't want to get this mindset, well, Victor just does that because he pastors this church. I'm doing it, yes, because I pastor this church, because I also want to set an example. This is how you should be too with each other. So it gets to the point where we're just all like that. That would be an awesome church to be a part of. And you know what? If we're like that, we'll be keeping this commandment. A new commandment I give unto you, that ye love one another as I have loved you, that ye also love one another. By this shall all men know that ye are my disciples, if ye have love one to another. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for your word. Thank you for the love that you showed us. And you showed us the perfect love. And Lord, you know, we are so far from that. But Lord, help us every day to strive for that perfection. Lord, we're a family here. Help us to realize that. Lord, we will sometimes fight like a family. But I pray, Lord, that you know, through the ad ad adversity, 
uh, Lord, we would love one another, that, that, that charity would abide, and Lord, we would strengthen here. Help us, Lord, to be proactive with our love and help us to serve one another in this body. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.